Hey guys, today we've got a new printer. This came all the way from Turkey, and this is the Zax X3 Core XY. So any of you that know me, this is actually my favorite part, is ripping off the protective film off of any of my electronics. Not only is it satisfying, but I can make sure that there's no marks or scratches on my plastics and glass. So right off the bat, you can see that this guy's pretty substantial. The, the build size is 220 by 230 by 250 on the Z. And due to the you know, glass windows, you can see it very clearly from all angles. I'm actually gonna turn it sideways as I start to pull out the, uh, the materials from the, from the inside. On the top, you may have seen me pulling off the uh, plastic film or protective film on this. So you've got this little window that can be removed. So that's useful if you're printing uh, PLA where you want to have uh, you know, cool air blowing on your print to cool your print effectively. It can get pretty warm in an enclosed printer like this. So in some cases, having that off will, will help ventilate some of the hot air at the top. Uh, on other printers that don't have that, um, like on my Voron, I just leave the, the door open here. So in here, uh, we have a cantilevered style bed. So there's one lead screw at the back and then two smooth rods that it rides up and a spring steel build plate. It's actually rather thick. Uh, and it's got what looks like PEI laminated to both sides, smooth on both sides. And then we have the, you know, the heated bed, of course. And all of our boxes of tools and, and probably the manual and whatnot are underneath here. So I'm gonna plug it in and use the on-screen menu to raise the Z. So as you can see, we've got a large touch screen on the front there. And inside there are these little yellow clips. So I'll just take a moment here to pop these off. So they just kind of slide on the belts to stop the um, axis from moving forward and backwards during shipment. And I don't plan on moving X or Y right now, but let's just be safe and take them off. And there's one more at the back on the lead screw for the bed. Now, I can kind of open it, but I can't get it off, but at least it's not clamped on the lead screw anymore. So that should be fine. So on the touch screen, I'm gonna go to settings, axis movement, and then I could go Z axis movement. Now, I believe that homing would be Z zero would be at the top, but just to be safe, I'm gonna move it in increments. Um, now I think these are different, uh, uh, these move in different increments. So I think this is like 0.1, one and 10 millimeters or vice versa. Um, and because I think zero is at the top, I'm gonna to actually move this down. There we go, yeah. So that looks like that moved at 10 millimeters, 20 millimeters, 0 0.02, 0 0.03 for some reason. Well, let's get it all the way up here. Okay, so now I've got enough space where I can go in, start removing some of this packaging. So at the back, there's that clamp that I was referring to. There we go, this guy. So these are 3D printed, which is kind of neat. Actually, quite a few parts are 3D printed. This right here is 3D printed, so that would be on the textured bed when it was printed. Um, and also it looks like the fan shroud here on the hot end is 3D printed. Well, let's talk about the hot end. The hot end is a E3D V6. I believe it said it was titanium um, and it goes up to 300 degrees. Um, so that would mean that it has a, a high temp uh, thermistor uh, or thermocouple, depending. So there's also an inductive probe right here. Uh, and you know that it's inductive because a capacitive sensor would sense, you know, your hand. Induction is gonna sense uh, metallic objects, ideally steel. And so we have spring steel on the, on the build plate there. So that's, that's no problem. Um, so it does uh, mesh auto bed level compensation as we've seen for many years now. So it is Core XY, as I mentioned, which means it needs a combination of both belts to move, to move it horizontally or in the X or Y direction. If you only moved one set of belts, it'll actually move like diagonally across the bed. So that means the only weight moving back and forth in the Y direction is the rail with the hot end on it. And then in the X direction, it's just the hot end that moves back and forth. Uh, the Z, obviously cantilevered bed here, moves down 
to increase Z height, uh, and zero would be at the top, as I mentioned. It is a direct drive hot end, so that means that the, the pulling gear, the mechanism that's pushing the filament through the hot end, moves with the hot end and is very, very close, very short filament path between um, the extruder and, and the hot end. You will notice a Bowden tube or PTFE tube in here. That's really just to guide the filament into the top of the, the hot end assembly, and from there it's being pulled. Um, otherwise, the filament can kind of drag along lead screws and flop around in there while, while the printer's printing. So that's just kind of to keep it constrained. So at this point, I'll just throw the bed back in there. Yeah, it seems like the magnets are integrated into the, into the build plate. Yeah, they're recessed into the build plate. They're probably like high temperature neodymium magnets instead of a magnetic sheet. Uh, magnetic sheets, you know, their Curie temperature isn't that high, so they can lose their magnetism over 70, 80 degrees or so, they start to diminish. Um, some of these high temp, like NH54, I think they're called, uh, high temp neodymium magnets have a much higher Curie temp and a much stronger pull, uh, even at high temperatures. Uh, speaking of high temperatures, I mentioned 300 degrees on the hot end. The uh, build surface here will go to 100 degrees Celsius. So I know one of the um, features that the literature touts is the ability to swap out components. So I mentioned there's a lot of 3D printed brackets on the hot end assembly. Um, just by printing a different bracket, you'd be able to support a different hot end, such as maybe a mosquito. I'm not sure offhand if they support a dragon hot end, uh, but you're not locked into some proprietary hot end assembly for this manufacturer. So I've moved the Z at this point. Normally I like to just make sure that all the axes are moving as expected. Um, and you know, your first time you home something, you wanna be there ready to turn it off in case something goes wrong, or in case you forgot to pull one of these out and you hear a bit of a grinding noise or something. Um, you're not gonna permanently damage anything or very unlikely to, but I just like to take that kind of cautious approach. So I moved the Z, let's go back and let's move the X. So it says it's at minus six, which we haven't homed anything, so it really has no idea where it is relative to the overall build size, but that seems to be moving okay. So this is tens, that is ones as expected, and that's 0.1. Um, so I expect that labels will be coming in a future firmware, so by the time you're watching this, that's probably already resolved. Uh, and let's move Y. Okay, so Y increases as you go to the back, decreases as you come to the front. Okay, so everything's moving fine, sounds good. Um, being that it's Core XY, we do have linear rails. So on the Y axis here, there's a linear rail on either side. So it glides along those moving forward and back. And then you have a linear rail <laughs> on the top of the X axis here. So that's the bar going across. On top of that is the linear rail and that's what the hot end assembly slides along. Um, linear rails are great for getting extremely accurate constrained movement and not really needing any, uh, any maintenance like V wheels or something would over time. From the inside of the printer, this back wall here, there's actually another three inches or so of space between that back wall and the actual exterior back of the printer. And in that space, they've housed um, the motors for um, the A and B motors, so the motors that move the combination of the X and Y, as I mentioned, they work in concert with each other. Um, so both those motors are hidden inside there. The Z lead screw motor is at the bottom there, and the lead screw is integrated into that motor. So it's not held on there with a coupler or anything like that, it's actually right into the motor itself. And also within that three inch section there, we have all of the electronics. So unlike some other printer designs that have the electronics all in like a top assembly, well, that's where the heat's rising, or in a bottom compartment, which is difficult to get to, especially when the printer is this hefty. Um, it's much, much easier to work on it when you can just flip it around the back. Okay, so I'm gonna lean over the table here a little bit. At the top here, we see the HEPA filter that that fan at the top inside is blowing out the back. Um, so it's drawing air in the front and straight out the back. Uh, we have the filament runout sensor here. So our filament is gonna go up in here. We haven't attached the spool holder, but I'm assuming that's where it's gonna go. And then inside here, you can see some little bit of glow. Um, that's where we've got the control board, the A and B motor that I mentioned, uh, and the power supply. So these are electrically certified when you get them from us. Um, inside there, there is the Meanwell power supply. And I think the 350 watts, yeah, these machines are rated for a total power output of 350 watts. 
Um, and then there's the uh, hardwire ethernet. So it's got both Wi-Fi and hardwire capabilities. So I kind of skipped over my regular spiel. As we're unboxing a printer, I always say, read your manual. Um, now would be a good time to take a look through the manual and familiarize yourself with a bunch of the features of the printer. Um, it'll likely guide you through the Wi-Fi connection process as well, though we're gonna do that together here. Um, and I also know that they have a set of software to help manage your potential fleet of these printers. So they call it X Desktop, and that is their slicing and fleet management software. So you can queue up jobs to your various printers um, from, from this manufacturer. Uh, and they also have a cloud offering. Uh, I haven't looked into the cloud one too much. I'm gonna play in the desktop and you're gonna see a little bit of that in a few minutes. So on the screen, we're still on the motion screen. Let's go back. Let's poke around a little bit, just kind of familiarize ourselves with the options that we have here. Um, so under settings, um, we've obviously seen the axis movement. Uh, motors are off, so hitting that will release any kind of locking tension on the motors, so de-energize uh, the steppers, and then you could slowly manually move uh, you know, the components around if you needed to. So if I was doing work on the hot end, I'd be able to slide the hot end over. You know, there's still resistance there, of course, because it's not like anything is detached. But if those motors are energized, I mean, that's, it's not gonna move, right? I mean, you can, but you're gonna really feel that resistance. Um, so go to the zero point, so that's gonna home all axes. And I'm, I'm comfortable doing that now because we've moved each of the axes independently of one another. So let's hit that. Interesting. So home is at the bottom. Or not. So there is a limit switch at the bottom. That just might be like a kill switch in case it's gone too far down. But there we go. So it's used the um, inductive sensor there to sense the bed. And I mean, that worked as expected, as one would think. Um, so that's kind of cool though, having that limit switch there. Um, just as a fail safe in case um, it is increasing to its max, to Z max there, um, that it's not gonna go any further and start banging into the bottom. Okay, so bed calibration, I'm gonna assume that's auto bed leveling or mesh bed leveling. Um, filament settings. So we've got load filament, extrude filament, and unload filament. So load filament's gonna be your pre-canned, you know, pull this filament in X number of millimeters. Now, normally with a Bowden setup, you want, you know, 300 millimeters to load the filament all the way to the hot end. But remember, our pulling gear is right on the hot end, being that it's direct drive. So you're gonna have to manually feed the filament until it gets to that gear. And then you can hit load filament, which is probably gonna pull it in 20 or 30 millimeters or something like that. And then unload would just be a rapid yank out of the hot end um, to, to facilitate removal. Uh, and then you'll just manually pull it the rest of the way out. Um, so we're not gonna do those at this moment. Um, preheating, so this is your standard preheat the bed or hot end or maybe both. So if I hit start, I can choose the temperature for both of them and then I can hit okay. Um, stop preheating, well that's self-explanatory. And yeah, that's everything else. Is there another menu here? Oh, there we go. So we've got maintenance, under maintenance, we've got go to the max points. So that makes sense. That would be that kill switch at the bottom there. So it's at, it's at max Z right now. Um, calibration points. So this is going to be, it's likely gonna to move to each of the say 16 if it's a four by four or 25 is a five by five, each of the calibration points. Um, this may be for fine tuning the bed, mesh bed leveling that it performs to dial in individual points. No, no, it's actually doing the mesh bed leveling, the full thing. That's one of those cases where I should have read the manual. Um, so while that's doing the mesh bed leveling there, um, I'll talk about the electronics a little bit. Um, so it is using pretty quiet stepper drivers. I don't know what they are um, offhand. They're probably Trinamic if I had to guess, uh, but I just don't know which model. Um, it is using a 32-bit proprietary board. I think they call it the X board. So it looks like it's done the calibration points. Now, I wouldn't want to do my mesh bed leveling with everything cold like I did here. I mean, the hot end doesn't matter because you're not actually using the hot end to, to check how 
close it is to the bed with like a piece of paper, like on an older machine. Um, but you would want the bed up to temperature for sure, because um, you know things expand when they're warm, right? Turn the fan on or off. We'll manually turn on the part cooling fan and turn off the part cooling fan. So the fan that you see at the front is the part cooling fan that's blowing down through the little shroud uh, to the tip of the nozzle. On the left-hand side of the hot end, so facing me, is another fan, and that fan is temperature controlled, and that blows across the little fins on the hot end um, to keep the cold side of the hot end cold. Um, if that fan's not working, you're gonna end up getting a jam as the filament softens as it goes into your hot end. In the info menu, we see some information about contacting support. Um, we also see Wi-Fi and Ethernet info. Now, neither one's connected at this moment. Uh, the total printing time, etc. And factory settings, of course, is gonna put it back to defaults. So if you actually listened to me and read your manual, you'd know that we can't connect to the Wi-Fi on the screen. We're gonna have to do that from our computer following the instructions in the, in the manual. So we'll take a look at that as we go to the PC in just a minute. So let's double back now, and those items we pulled underneath, pulled out from underneath the bed there, we've got the toolbox, the X toolbox. So in here we have a very secure uh, USB stick. So I'm gonna assume that this has some pre-sliced files on it, as well as maybe a couple of those 3D printed replacement parts in case we need any. We've got 50 mil of transmission oil. So this is likely the very lightweight oil for the lead screw. I'm gonna read the manual and just double check first. But we've got an oil. We've got Uhu glue stick. So I remember using a lot of glue stick back in the day. Elmer's worked pretty good. Uhu works fantastic. Now, knowing that we do have PEI on here, as long as we're cleaning my greasy fingerprints off that surface with rubbing alcohol before we print on it, there should be zero problem getting something like PLA to stick to your PEI. Um, getting rid of that oil is key. Um, and when in doubt, clean it. Just clean your bed constantly. Um, if, however, you are having problems, their manual recommends using Uhu. Now, myself, the only time I would use this is more as like a release agent, especially if I'm printing on smooth um, PI sticker kind of material like this. Um, certain materials like PETG, um, maybe not nylon, some other high temp materials can like almost weld to the PEI. Um, and then you've ruined your PEI or at the very least marked it all up trying to get them off. Um, so you can use this to put a barrier between your PEI and those parts. Um, so experiment with that a little bit, but if you're doing everything right, if your leveling is good, um, you know, you don't have any greasy fingerprints on there, you've got the right temperatures for your particular material, there should be zero reason to use this for PEI or other common materials. I mentioned that I forgot to attach the spool holder. So this guy here is the spool holder. It's 3D printed and it looks like it expands. Yeah, it's for larger spools, smaller spools. And I think it just goes in and twists in that hole at the back. And of course we've got flush cutters and we've got a tiny acupuncture needle. Uh, this is for clearing a clogged nozzle or at least assisting to clear a clogged nozzle if that happens. Um, it's nice that it's in this protective case because I have stuck myself with it reaching into the box before. So be careful. And then it came with a spool of Zach's 3D printer filament. So it came with a spool of natural color PLA. So it's kind of translucent. It looks about 800 grams, it says. Uh, and it gives us some settings of between 200 and 220 degrees Celsius. So for our first few prints, especially anything that they have sliced on there for us, I'm gonna use their filament. And then from there, we're gonna experiment with a few more engineering types of materials. I'm going to print with uh, some PETG, I'm gonna print with some standard nylon, and then I'm gonna print with some about 10% carbon fiber nylon. Um, for that stuff, I'm gonna to need to change the nozzle. So this does come with a 0.4 millimeter brass nozzle, and carbon fiber like that will eat a brass nozzle for breakfast. For that, you're gonna to wanna to change the nozzle to something hardened. So you could get like a hardened A2 tool steel. Um, some people have used even stainless steel, though I'm not a fan of that. Um, there's also some, I think it's vanadium, um, there's uh, nickel plated, nickel -plated uh, copper nozzles um, that have a lot more abrasion resistance than the brass. 
Um, but just make sure that whatever nozzle you're putting in there uh, is meant for or rated for or approved for um, abrasive filaments before you run carbon fiber through them. Otherwise, that 0.4 millimeter nozzle is gonna be point who knows what when you're done with it. And so you're gonna have uh, a horrible time. You know, you're trying to lay down a line that is 0.4 millimeters and it's anybody's guess what that is. So just be careful as you start moving into some of the more exotic and abrasive materials. Another thing to account for in those materials is that different materials, different metals, will conduct heat differently. So that stainless steel option is a terrible heat conductor in comparison. Um, the nickel-plated copper is extremely high heat conductivity. Um, so just kind of compare the conductivity of that heat to brass. So if you know that this prints well at 220 on brass, maybe that means it's 230 on hardened tool steel, right? Something to be aware of anyway. Okay, so with all that said, that gives you an overview. It's my first look at this machine. I'm gonna spend the next week printing. We'll get some of the prints off the SD card and those items that I mentioned, some more engineering prints, and then we'll come back and take a look at the results. Now I have already launched the software once, so it may look a little bit different for you, uh, but it's already detected the printer on the network. So because I'm on the same network as this, it sees that I have an X3 here, um, and that in this case, I've also put in a USB drive that isn't uh, uh, properly formatted. Um, so if you don't have a drive in or it's not properly formatted, then you'll get this error message. You won't be able to print remotely until that's, that's corrected. Um, so I'll choose my X3 here, I'll click load a model, and I'm just loading the 3D Benchy. Um, so now with the correct model selected, we hit prepare model for print, and then we get to choose our options. By default, this was set to 0.15 millimeter layer height. Uh, I'm just gonna set it to 0.2, which is kind of standard for what we would normally print, um, but you can, by all means, go to much lower layers. Uh, and I've got the Zax PLA selected, so it's automatically going to load the proper print temperatures and settings that they've defined for their PLA. Uh, we don't need any supports for this model, and I don't actually want a raft. Um, and it gives you a little information tab here that shows you, don't show that and I don't want a raft. Um, so I'm gonna unselect raft, 20% infill, eh, that's probably fine, maybe a little overkill. But then let's go to advanced. So, you know, we turned off the raft here. Um, that's unnecessary, but I will do a skirt just to kind of purge a few lines around it. Our infill pattern is gonna be lines, which is fine. And there are picture examples of the different infill patterns. Uh, top layer count, so this was set to four by default. I'm gonna do five top layers, uh, four bottom layers should be fine. Um, so essentially it'll be um, 0.8 millimeters thick on the, on the bottom and one millimeter thick on the top. Um, I consider at least one top layer to be sacrificial because it's kind of spanning across the, across the infill. We want the fan to be 100% for sure. Um, and if cooling is still inadequate, um, I would probably take the top off since with PLA, we, we don't really want a, a hot chamber. Uh, XY tolerance, I'm not gonna play with. These other settings here, um, I'll probably leave these as a defaults. One thing you could do is a monotonic top and bottom skin. So if you had a large, say flat box here and you wanted all the lines to be kind of continuous as it does the top layer, instead of kind of randomly going here and then skipping and going over here, um, this just makes sure that it does it one side to the other. Worth noting also is that the moment I turned on skirt on adhesion type, it actually checked this raft box again. Um, but this doesn't actually mean raft. This should probably read adhesion type um, or adhesion, something to that effect. Um, Cause if I turn this off, raft goes off. If I turn this back on to skirt, raft is back on, even though it's not really gonna be a raft. Um, if you needed to set any other um, material parameters, you're gonna have to go to custom and then you can put in temperature, retraction, etc. Uh, but because we have the Zax PLA, we'll leave it like that and we'll hit slice. Okay, there we go. Uh, how many grams, how long it's gonna take approximately, two hours. Um, we also, you might have noticed, we don't get to choose any kind of speed settings for print speeds. It's uh, predefined based on the material. So now I could save it to a flash disk, which is locally, and plug in the USB drive. Um, but I wanna actually format the USB drive I've plugged into the printer, and then we'll come right back here. Okay, so now with the drive formatted as FAT32 for compatibility purposes, and plugged back into the printer, that message is gone. And now we can say print now. 
It's going to upload it to the printer over Wi-Fi in this case, and then uh, it'll store it on the, <laughs> you can probably hear the beeps there, it'll store it on the USB stick, uh, and then the printer will just start heating up and do its self-leveling procedure and then start printing. All right, we're back uh, just over a week or so later. I uh, spent some time printing. As you saw, we did uh, wireless printing using their slicer. In the time that we've had the printer, there's been a couple of firmware updates. Uh, and I know that there's also a new version of the slicer that is in development right now. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what additional features they expose um, so that you have kind of more control when you're working wirelessly or remotely from the printer um, instead of just printing, preheating, and, and kind of canceling the print. Um, but anyway, it's good to see it as actively being developed. Um, and I know there's even more activity with the Z3, the big brother to this guy. Um, so stay tuned for that. We were using their PLA. Um, and their PLA happens to have an NFC tag in it. Now that NFC tag has no bearing on this particular printer, but the bigger one will actually detect what kind of filament it is and make sure that the settings that you're printing with are kind of compatible with that filament. Um, in this case, we used, uh, you can use the preset for the Zax PLA, which will, like, as I showed in the slicer, handle most of the temperature and speed and everything settings. Um, but because it doesn't know what filament it is, you could have used custom and chosen to override those values if you so chose. So most of these are PLA. Both of these definitely are. Um, one of these two is PLA. Uh, the other one is ABS, just in a natural ABS. Um, and I'll explain what these were for. And then this was um, uh, just another ABS print, kind of the first one that I did. Didn't turn out quite as good, um, but it's also old junky ABS that I don't even know what brand it was. It was sitting in a drawer. Um, so I'm not gonna fault it for that. So one of the first prints that I did was just this little bracket. It's part of a tabletop um, vice uh, mount or vice grip kind of thing. Um, and I printed this a few times. This one is the fastest one that I did. So I maxed out the speed in the slicer and then proceeded to print it a couple times, increasing the speeds on the printer, you know, 100%, 150%, etc. Um, and as you get up to the, you know, upper bounds of acceptable printing, uh, it would end up bulging at the corners a little bit. And so that's an indication that our pressure advance or linear advance uh, tuning um, could use a little bit of work. Uh, either that or we're gonna have to slow down the speeds um, or uh, just deal with kind of the bulgy corners. Um, now, as far as speeds go, when we use the Zax PLA profile, I think the speeds are 60-ish millimeters a second. Um, again, you're not really in control of that. It's all predefined. Um, travels are a little bit more, infill is a little bit more, but 60 for the outer perimeter seemed to be about what it was at. So this took quite a while. I also probably used a little bit too much infill. I think this is about 25% infill, and you can kind of see the infill right through the top there. So there's only six top layers, five bottom, two perimeter, and then 25% infill. And I mean, this is rigid as you would expect. And honestly, the surface finish is, is absolutely beautiful on this guy. Um, you know, no, uh, obviously no layer shifts or anything like that, um, no banding, uh, you know, the filaments seem to be consistently extruding, so, I mean, it's nothing really much to say, it printed perfect. So, you know, when you are using their filament and their slicer and just choose their filament and hit go, it takes a lot of the guesswork out of it. It just might be a little bit more slow or conservative um, than you may otherwise wish, right? So there's that. Um, and being that this is an enclosed chamber, uh, after I printed a couple PLA things, I was really interested in doing some ABS. Um, so I took one of these Voron tolerance test prints. Um, it's a threaded nut with a, obviously, female side. It's printed like this on the bed. Um, that way you don't end up having any of the elephant's foot effect um, on any of the surfaces that are mating together. Um, and absolutely beautiful. Um, and so that's, uh, I think this was printing at about 200, 205 uh, degrees Celsius. And so then I went and did custom and I used a brand new spool of natural ABS and I used the junker spool of ABS as well. Um, and really uh, I wanted to try out two different ABSs because I know that this natural one prints beautifully and this one's a little bit more temperamental. Um, but I also took the opportunity of printing the second one and doing it at 200% um, just to see if there's any uh, inaccuracies that are introduced that would affect kind of those tolerances on the threads and other than this being marginally stickier um, if that makes sense uh, you know just a little uh, less space or less tolerance there uh, there's absolutely no difference um, so that's a testament to 
the construction of the machine, uh, the rigidity of it. I mean, this thing weighs a metric ton. I want to say it's probably 75 pounds, somewhere in that ballpark. It's not light, um, but it's, uh, I mean, it's well planted. Um, and then, you know, the frame is very rigid. Uh, and as far as like the motion control system, you've got Gates belts, as you would expect. And you also have high wind rails. And these are genuine high wind rails. Um, so, you know, if you've ever looked up those, you know that those are not inexpensive. So they've, they've really not spared any expense as far as using quality components, quality construction here. Um, and, and it shows. You know, I'm, I'm personally not a fan of cantilevered beds. Uh, typically, there can be a lot of flex in those, but that's also in a lot of the cheaper printers. Uh, when done right, it's clearly not a problem at all. Um, the auto bed leveling worked absolutely perfectly, um, and it's kind of built into the start G code when you slice with their slicer and send it to the printer. It does the bed leveling sequence and then starts printing, and it was absolutely perfect. The only thing you have to be worried about is if you change that nozzle, you will have to change the Z offset that's kind of standard stuff with any of these bed leveling kind of systems um, so that the probe and then knows where the nozzle is in relation to it and so that that first layer is exactly the perfect space away from the bed beyond that it will handle everything else um, so first look first impressions I'm, I'm pretty impressed um, I always want a larger build volume myself uh, I find that uh, a lot of the times the items that I'm printing just won't fit or I won't be able to fit enough of them if I need to print two at once for whatever reason, you know, cut down on time, cut down on manpower, removing prints and reloading the, the printer and reading the printer. Um, so bigger is always better in my mind, but if, if this size does the prints that you need and you want to hit print and walk away and have a print come out, this might be a great machine for you. Hopefully you found that useful. Remember, like and subscribe and ring that bell to get notified. Thanks for watching.